Well, let's stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word. Open your Bible to the Gospel of Luke. And find chapter number 11 as we continue our series on prayer. Tonight we're moving into the second part of our look at Luke 11. The instructions of Christ regarding prayer. Next we'll go into some illustrations of the... uh, of his teaching on the subject, and finally some application and then qualification. But right now we're looking at instruction, and we're going to look at um, or receive from the Lord insight into what is almost certainly the most fundamental principle of effective prayer. Without this, you probably will not be very successful in your prayer life. So let's look at chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke and begin our reading at verse 5. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is uh, in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And then Jesus goes on with some application that we'll look at beginning next time. Father, help me tonight to make clear this most essential element of a successful prayer life to every heart gathered here. Help us to understand this basic principle of persistency or fervency or as it's or the word that's used here, importunity. And I ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're looking at Jesus' instruction on prayer. We should pray what the disciples prayed. And some, when I say that, think that I mean we should pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but no. I think we should use that as an exercise, as a practice prayer, as I've already brought out. But What I mean is that we should pray, Lord, teach us to pray. We should ask the Lord to teach us to pray, to help us learn how to pray. And I hope you're prayerfully seeking wisdom and understanding and insight that will help you have a more effective, a more effectual prayer life. We read a story here of a man who wouldn't give up until he got what he came for. Now, when we look at this story... It's often missed that the point is Jesus is not like the friend. Our Father in Heaven is not like this. In other words, many take the story to, to, to suggest that what you've, got to do, what you've got to do to get something from God is just go after Him and go after Him and go after Him and pester Him and pester Him and keep pestering Him until finally He yields and gives you what it is you're pestering him for. But you miss the main point of this story if that's what you take from it. This story actually says that's the way we are, but God is not like that. That we are such persons as might be prevailed upon by somebody being persistent and almost obnoxious. I mean, think about it. This guy has come to your home. You've already gone to bed. I mean... And then his, apparently his friend kind of imposed on him, and so he imposed on you, right? He's got a friend that shows up in the middle of the night, apparently, and he wants something to set before him. He doesn't have anything to set before him, so it must have been a surprise visit. So he goes to his friend's house, and he asks for some bread so he can have something to feed his, uh, his journeying friend, and all that's nice, but good night. You know, he's, it must be pretty late because everybody's already gone to bed of course you know in those days they didn't have switches on the walls you flipped and lights came on you understand in those days uh, when the sun went down activity wound down pretty quickly you know of course they had candles and other things that this they had lanterns they did have ways of of illuminating their houses but they probably weren't up till well one or two o'clock in the morning watching tv yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? It was a, it was a different kind of a situ- situation. They would probably be more inclined to get to bed a little earlier than, than many of us do. Um, in any event, it was late enough, so this fellow had gone to bed and had his children in bed and obviously did not appreciate being disturbed. 
But this friend felt his need was such that he was compelled to go ahead and, and push on the relationship he had with his friend. So his friend does not say to him, your emergencies does not constitute an emergency on me. Or, as I read one time when I went to get some printing done, your bad planning does not constitute an emergency for us. <laughs> and so, you know, right? But that's the way we are, we humans. I mean, we don't like being put off. We don't like being put out, I should have said. We don't like uh, being inconvenienced, you know, this way, especially if there is some discernment of a lack of planning, a lack of uh, preparation on the part of the other. We're all like that. We tend to be that way. But you know what is interesting is that God is not like that. When you go to the Lord, it's very, very, very interesting, that verse in James chapter 1, verse 5, where it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally. And what's the next phrase there? Does anybody remember it? And upbraideth not. You know what that means? He doesn't spend any time saying, Well, it's about time you showed up. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He doesn't say, Well, uh, you know, you should have come here. You should have done this. You should have done that. He doesn't upbraid. You've come for wisdom? Okay, here. <clears throat> that's very important. Now, and that story, that's what's illustrated here, is that he doesn't upbraid. When you come to him for help, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking to you about what you should have done. In my experience, I have found very often when I come to the Lord with desperation, he answers the desperate need very quickly. But in the aftermath, we do have some conversation with one another about what I should have done. There's that too, right? You know, I'm not talking about egregious sin. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, committing a carnal, uh, a carnal, lustful appetite of sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that you just didn't plan like you should have planned. You didn't take care of responsibilities like you should have. You didn't, right? A whole bunch of things like that. And we all are guilty of those sorts of things. It's good to know that we can knock on the Lord's door late at night and he won't spend a whole lot of time telling us about how we should have bought bread the day before. You know, why didn't you take care of this then? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you? I don't have to listen to a whole list of all these things. He'll just, he'll just meet our need and then, and then perhaps we'll talk about some of those things that need to be taken care of. It's a very important principle. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. The story is simple. This man had gone to bed with his family. His friend comes over for some bread. He tells his friend, I'm sorry, I'm already, I've already gone to bed. Uh, basically, he's saying, come on back tomorrow. Maybe I can help you out. But the man says, no, i got to have the bread now. My friend's there now. I need the bread now. And he persists. And the uh, moral of the story is that, uh, that even though friendship wasn't enough by itself for that man to be ready to give, Friendship was not alone enough. He says, however, if he keeps coming back, keeps coming back, he will overwhelm the resistance of his friend and his friend will finally yield. And the point here is that that's not the way God is. God never holds anything back from you because you're an inconvenience to him. God never holds back from you anything you need because you didn't plan like you should have or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. That could be sin in your way and an offense that needs to be addressed. That's a different matter. But God does not require of you some kind of, a, well, I just, I'm, I'm repeating myself too much. He doesn't bother upbraiding you. There's the bottom line. And here's, here's the thing tonight. You need to understand that persistency or importunity, rightly understood, should never encourage vain repetition. When you understand importunity correctly, as I hope to help you do tonight, you should not take from the lesson where Jesus is encouraging us to be importunate, not impertinent, <laughs> but importunate. He's encouraging us to be earnest and zealous and persistent and keep coming. He is encouraging us to do that. But he's not encouraging us to do that 
in order to, you know, ask us or require of us vain repetition. Vain repetition is not what he's asking for. He's not asking for stubborn insistence on our own will either. He's not asking that we, we just keep on saying, I demand this, I demand this, I demand this, I demand this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I demand this. No, that's not what he's saying here. And he's not saying we should be arrogant in our assumptions or in our presumptions on God. What it should encourage are these four things. A proper understanding of importunate prayer. A proper understanding of persistence in prayer. A proper way of looking at the idea of persevering in prayer. Coming to a place of prevailing in prayer. It should encourage these four things. First thing it should encourage is humility. When you rightly understand what persistency in prayer entails and what it means, it should encourage humility. And second, it should encourage holiness. So right off the top, persistency in prayer, importunity in prayer, perseverance in prayer should produce and encourage humility or surrender. And holiness or sanctification. The third thing it should do is provide clarity. You should become increasingly clear on what it is you're asking for. What it is that you want from God. You should become more and more aware of what it is you're asking for. You should become clear not only on what it is you're asking for, you should become increasingly clear on your motives for asking. As you persist, your own motives should become increasingly clear to you. Finally, fourth, you should draw nigh unto God through persistent prayer. These are the things that importunate, persistent, persevering prayer should produce. They should produce holiness. They should produce humility. They should produce greater clarity and, of course, closeness. The whole idea of persistent prayer is getting closer and closer and closer to God personally. What happens in persistent prayer is the focus in a subtle way, changes from the thing you're asking for to the person from whom you're asking it. And that's a very important part of the process. You've heard me say it before. Often God resists us. Well, it can be because there's pride in our heart. He resists the pride, but gives grace to the lowly. But you keep persisting, you'll break down that pride. You'll break down that pride and you'll become more and more humble. The Bible says that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The Bible teaches that holiness is the ground upon which we fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And sometimes persistency will finally come to prevailing prayer or persevering prayer becomes prevailing prayer when you persevere to that place where you become more aware of areas in your life that need some change. This or that thing in your, in your life that's still out there in the darkness and hasn't been brought into the light yet. Uh, we have fellowship with the Lord when we walk in the light as He is in the light. So He is in the light. When we walk in it, we have fellowship with Him. But sometimes we get one foot over there in, the, in a dark place and, and the other foot in, in the light. And we got one hand, maybe two hands over here. And I can illustrate this. I'm looking a little bit ridiculous. You got one head, toe over here into the darkness and everything else is over here in the light. But you still got a toe in the darkness. Well, God might want you to come on over here a little bit. See, what you need to understand about God's interest and what God's doing when he is delaying, it seems to us, delaying his response, it's not that he's upbraiding us. It's that he's drawing us. He's drawing us closer and closer to him. And that brings us to that fourth thing, closeness. So let's go ahead and take a look at these and it'll be a relatively short message. I should never have said that. I've ruined more short messages with that statement than anything else I've ever done. But anyway, uh, humility. I think the best example that you'll find in the Bible of how perseverance encourages humility 
is the story of the woman of Canaan. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 15, 21 to 28. I do relate to the story in a personal way for a lot of reasons. And I often relate the story in my preaching when it comes to any, close to any topic I'm touching on because I like this story so much. But this is the story of the woman from Canaan whose daughter was vexed with the devil and she came to Jesus for help. When she came to Jesus for help, she asked him that he would heal her daughter. But Jesus ignored her. He didn't even acknowledge her. He didn't respond at all. She continued pursuing him. She continued praying, even though he was ignoring her. Well, after a little while, the disciples began to become annoyed. I mean, they observe, obviously, Jesus is not stopping. And, you know, one time he was walking along and, and a fellow said, uh, uh, thou, uh, Jesus, thou son of David, uh, help me. And the Bible says Jesus stopped. And then he turned toward that man and went to him and healed him. Well, Jesus didn't stop this time. He's walking along and she's asking for help and Jesus just kept going. And so it's reasonable that the disciples concluded he's not going to help this woman of Canaan. That's a, that's a significant thing. Uh, we've been going through um, the Chronicles of Jacob and we've, we've been talking about God's attitude toward the Canaanite women. How it seems that he was agreeable that the sons of Jacob might marry a Hivite or perhaps a Jebusite, but he did not want them marrying those Canaanite gals. These daughters of Canaan were a problem. Remember, Esau married a couple of those of Heth, and that was pretty close. The Hittites were right up there with the Canaanites and their debauchery and sin and other issues. But anyway, uh, well, it's spending too much more time there. Just understand that it's significant the Holy Spirit brings out that this was a woman of Canaan. She was a woman of the land. She's one of those daughters of the land that we read about in the, in the book of Genesis. And so that bias, that prejudice certainly was at work in the mind and heart of all the apostles. And, and as far as they were concerned, no doubt it was confirmed by Jesus Christ's own unwillingness to even acknowledge that woman was there. So they finally said, Jesus, send her away for she crieth after us. Now I thought that was interesting too. They didn't just presume to go send her away. Jesus had been training his disciples for some time. By now, and I, I can only imagine that they knew better than to just send somebody away. Jesus wasn't somebody who sent people away. I mean, if you think about it. Why didn't the disciples just say, "Hey, lady, obviously he's not going to help you today. I want you just leave us alone." <laughs> why didn't they do that? Why did they go to Jesus and say, "Lord, send her away. She crieth after us," because that was. A no-no. That was against protocol. That's, you don't do that in Jesus' company. It had to come from him. So he continued to ignore her, but he talked to them when his disciples came and said, send her away, she crieth after us. Jesus spoke to them. And he told them what, well, they already knew, but he told them, what he wanted her to hear. He told them, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Now he didn't say that for their benefit. They already knew that. He said that for her benefit. Now, not only has he, shall we at least in our own way of looking at social interaction, he's being rude. That's the way most lost people would look at this story. While wow, Jesus is being rude. He's not even talking, doesn't even acknowledge her. And then when his disciples come and say, send her away, she crieth after us. He doesn't say, yeah, I'll go ahead, send her away. He doesn't say that. He, he says this strange thing. I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She hears that. And he keeps on going. She keeps on crying after them. And she keeps persisting. Finally, the Bible says she comes and worships him. 
she comes and evidently knelt down before him, pleading with him, and in worship beseeched him, help my daughter. The Bible says that's when Jesus stopped. Now he stopped. And now he speaks to her directly. And he says it's not meet, and the word M-E-E-T means not fitting, not appropriate. It is not appropriate for me to take the bread of the children and to cast it to dogs. Whoa. Can you imagine? Now, first of all, well, I'll get to that part in a minute. <laughs> so now, basically, I mean, well, a lost person, here's the way they hear those sorts of things. You call on me a dog? Jesus might have responded by saying, yes, or he might have responded by saying, I just said that that's a biblical principle, or that's a principle. You don't take the food from children and throw it to dogs. But the lost always turn things around in that way. So she, however, continues pursuing him, and she says this. She says, truth, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Yeah, amen is right. Jesus said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Isn't that beautiful? There are only a few people you'll find in the Bible who were told by God, you go ahead and ask for anything you want. Only a few. Here's one of them. Solomon was another one. He blew it. Let's hope she didn't. But there are only a handful of people you'll find in the Bible where God just comes along and says, ask for anything you want. Oh, um, excuse me, accept all of us. Whatsoever you ask, in faith believing, it shall be done for you. Right? That's a different sermon, but it's, it's a powerful point. That we are very favored in our prayer status. The message that comes up a little later in the series. Let's come back here. Here's a woman that illustrates almost all of these four things that we're looking for in persevering prayer. She's pursuing God for a need in her life. She's pursuing Christ. As she pursues him, the first thing she experiences is silence. Most Christians give up right there. Very few will continue asking and, and prevail through the silence. It isn't unusual at all for God's initial response to our prayer to be silence. Not for all the reasons we see working out in this story. I think the story, uh, however, does illustrate something that applies to all of us. How many times have you ever prayed and the answer was immediate? Probably not as many times as you've prayed and the answer was a little ways down the road. I've had immediate answers to prayer. I think probably all of our prayers are, are answered immediately. It's a different message. I keep reaching. That's the problem with doing these series. I think them through over there and I keep reaching over and grabbing stuff before we're there. But, you know, there is a biblical principle that all of our prayers are answered immediately. Just, some of them are, just sometimes the answer is wait. <laughs> sometimes the answer is right now and it's not now. But in any event, that's later. Our experience is like the experience of this woman. Do you believe with me that Jesus knew the end of this story right at the beginning of it? Amen. Jesus knew exactly what he was going for. He looked at her and he saw a treasure, a valuable treasure. Listen, the currency of heaven is faith. That's the currency of heaven. Faith. His grace works through faith. Our salvation comes to us by His grace through our faith. Our sanctification and growth is all by His grace through our faith. I mean, faith is that <clears throat> fulcrum at which 
the power of God moves in our lives. It's that point of contact between God and us. It's that point of faith. And he's always looking for it. He says, uh, he laments in one place, when the Son of Man shall return, will he find faith on earth? He's always looking for it. It's the treasure of heaven. He deals to every man it, uh, a measure. And what we do with it, we're stewards of it. But he, he values faith highly. So he saw that in her, but it was kind of buried deep. And through that whole process, he was bringing it out. Do you remember when he was talking to the rich young ruler? And he was bringing that rich young ruler along. You know, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well... Uh, that isn't going to happen. He tells them what it'll cost, you know. This, we, we've been through that story enough times. I think many of you know the story, if not most of you, and so uh, we won't take time to go back over it other than to say, you remember that point where the, the rich young man turned and walked away? And the Bible says that Jesus was sorry. He was sorry that he did. I believe that's also an occasion where Jesus knew the end of that story uh, from its beginning and he saw, he knew where it was going to go but that didn't change how, how it impacted him when it came, when that part of the story happened and the man turned away. He went away sorrowful and the Bible says that Jesus Christ was sorry to see him go. And so you understand that uh, we get this story, this woman coming after Jesus. He knows the end from the beginning. We get all that but it doesn't change how he responds in the moment to all of these things. Do you understand that principle? I call it the principle of immediacy where God is in that moment. He doesn't, even though he knows exactly where everything's going, he is still true to the moment. And he's in this moment with this woman and he's watching as she comes and he knows where it's going and it would have been sad if she stopped and it's sad when you stop. It's sorry to him when you stop. It's grieving to his Holy Spirit when you just don't get, you don't, you don't persevere to prevailing. You stop short. The Bible teaches this principle in many places. In one place it says that uh, we shall reap if we faint not. There's that huge if. And the, and the if is on our side. If we faint not. So many people, when they first start pursuing God for something they need in their life, they will stop short. Sometimes I think sometimes just that short of, get, of getting there. If this woman had left, if she had just become disheartened and walked away, the consequences were very, very dire. In her case, her daughter would have continued to be under the oppression of that devil. But she didn't give up. She stayed with it. She continued after him. Now, I don't know if this is what worked in her heart as this was going on, but I can see some profound holiness show up. Now, all of a sudden, she's moved from, here's what I want from you to, here's who you are to me, and she kneels down and she worships him. You see the progress there? Now she comes and worships him. I'm not pretending to know what was going on in her mind. I'm just looking at the story from the outside and I'm going, that's interesting. If she had given up during that silent time, she would not have come to that place where that working of God's grace in her heart would have brought her from a person coming to get something from him to a person who begins to see who he is. Now, she didn't forget about what it is she came for, but she encountered a moment there where she submitted to who he is. She worshipped him. That's telling me she's confessing that he is Lord. That's telling me she's acknowledging who he is. Not only what he can do or what she hopes he can do for her, but who he is in the whole universe. This is God, and she kneels down and she worships him. 
Well, he stops and responds. But how does he respond? He says, it's not fitting for me to give you the bread that belongs to the children. It's not appropriate. What you're asking me for is not appropriate. I've come for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. That's my mission right now. That changes, we know, after the cross. But that was the mission. I've come to call the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel to repent and to come back into the fold and to receive their Messiah. That's what I'm here to do. And you, you put the whole history of this thing. He's talking to a Canaanite who had been, you know, that, those people have been worshiping every single thing there is except God. But now she's worshiping Christ. That's huge. But his first response is kind of an insult. And some Christians, they, they get uh, discouraged during the silent part. And they give up and quit and faint too soon. And so don't prevail. But some will go on and th they'll hit some kind of a rebuff. Some kind of rebuff. Now I labored to say he doesn't upbraid. And he doesn't upbraid. But he will test he will test us. And what you've got to do is have the faith to believe when that's happening, you should stop and say, ooh, this is going to be good. Now think about it with me for just a moment. Did, did not, does not the Bible teach that, that our Father which art in heaven wants to answer your prayers? Isn't that what the Bible says? And isn't that what this chapter teaches? And we're going to get into it some more when we talk about that next part where we ask for the Holy Ghost and, and you know, if your Father will give you good things, do you not realize your Heavenly Father will even be more willing to give you good things? Well, it comes up later on. But, I mean, just for the moment, do you get it? Do you understand that God wants to answer your prayers? So therefore, if he wants to answer your prayers, but he's not responding to your prayer right now, that can only mean one thing. Something good is coming. He's up to something really, really good. I wish you'd catch hold of that. I wish that when you start praying and you don't get the answer you, you're looking for right away, that you would begin to realize, wait a minute, we're moving into a good zone here. This is exciting. Because when God does this kind of stuff, something good is coming. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's sort of like the kid that went into the... Was, was, I forget how the story goes now. I shouldn't even use it. But he goes in and he finds a big pile of horse manure and he says he's going to find a horse in there somewhere. There has to be a horse around here somewhere since there's so much evidence. I, I ruined that. But, you, <laughs> but that's one way of looking at it. The other way you look at that and you go, oh, no, 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 a bunch of that to pick up, you know. So one kid looks at that and says, hey, there's a horse around here somewhere. The other kid looks at that and says, oh, man, that's just more work for me to do. Well, that's the way Christians are. Christians, you know, they, they go into prayer. They have something they need. They go after it, and there's silence. And they take it negative. They go, oh, well, he doesn't care. Oh, well, he's not listening. Oh, well, I guess I'm not good enough. Oh, well, I guess. And, you know, it's sad. Because if you had faith, you would interpret that silence differently. You would interpret that silence as, I know some things about God. One of them is, he's always ready to answer our prayers. He's a good father. I know what it is to be a father and to want to give good things to your children. And to be ready to do it and have, you know, I, I understand that. And I know my Father in Heaven is far more so than I am inclined and ready to extend to us blessings and favor. He wants to do this. Therefore, if it's true that I know for a fact that God wants to give good things into my life, if I know that, then if I'm asking for something, and, you know, I'll get to this other part about clarifying some things in a moment but if I'm asking for something and it doesn't seem that he's responding that should heighten my anticipation 
It should excite my anticipation, not dampen it. It should cause me to say, ooh, this is going to a good place because I know a story about a woman who went after something and, and Jesus was silent to her, but I know how that story ended and I want an ending like that. So I'm going to stay after it. Then the rebuff comes. Something happens that kind of is almost a put off. How many times have you prayed for something and the exact opposite happens first? Come on, talk to me. I'm not alone here. That happens. I mean, I ask for something, and the reverse happens. I'm like going, what in the, what is that about? Well, let me give you some insight here. Sometimes that's what he does. He'll put a little rebuff out there. Why? You see, you're coming to him for something you want. While you're coming to him for something you want, he's looking at you for something he wants. Is that okay? Is it all right if God is saying, there's something I want here? and You haven't quite brought it yet. Is that okay? One thing he wanted from her was, she needed to understand who he was. She needed to worship him. A lot of Christians, they never make it through the silence to the place of genuine worship. Sometimes that silent part is just preparing your heart to enter into genuine, authentic surrender in worship to Him. Where in that process of praying and praying and seeking and seeking, you begin to get your eyes off the thing you're asking for and more on the person you're asking for help from. You follow what I'm saying? It becomes more about him than it does the thing you're asking for. And, and you move into that place where you begin to genuinely experience worship, where your will is letting go to his, where you're surrendering to him, where you're converting all your trust to him. You, sometimes in the silence, you've got to work past all your own plans and on your own ways that God's supposed to do this for you. So many times I try hard to avoid that, you know. When I go to the Lord in prayer, I try to avoid going to him with counsel. Please help me. I, I don't, I'm feeling pretty alone up here, although I hear some chuckling, so I guess you understand. I mean, you get, you know, you know how it is. We, we have, here's the way to do it. You know, I, I've learned, and I'm learning, I should say, to come to God with just a, here's what's needed, Lord, how you do it. I'm just look, I'm looking forward to watching. And when you can get to that place, you're coming into worship where you're surrendering your will and your way to him. So you come to that place of worship and then you get the rebuff. You know, it happens, it happens to me often. Again, like I said, you get the reverse or something happens that's really negative and you almost feel like, uh, you know, th that sounds like no to me. Have you ever just felt like God just said no? Well, this is where that clarifying part comes in. Because there is a time when God says no. When is it? When we ask amiss, that we may consume it upon our own lusts. There is a time when he says no, and that's where it, is, that's where it comes up. And so it might be necessary for you to do some purifying and some clarifying here. You might need to spend some time after the rebuff. And usually that's where this stage comes in. You go through the silent part. You finally come to a place of genuine worship. You're looking to him. And then some kind of rebuff happens. Something happens that makes you think, that, well, that was a pretty definite no. And, and yet you think about it and you realize, well, but wait a minute. I really do need this, Lord. I really do need this from you. I, I, I'm sorry that if I've come to you with some lust of the flesh involved and you start praying and thinking, thinking about that and, and you start getting clarified and you start getting clear and some things start clearing up for you. You begin to realize, yeah, I can see that I was coming at you with, with uh, uh, you know, taking care of something for me personally in a way that, that really wasn't 
Well, it was going to feed a lust of the flesh. It might feed adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, hatred, wrath, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, such like. It might be something that fits in one of those categories and you need to let the light of God's word work in your heart and mind as you examine your request and see if there's anything in it that's attached to a lust of the flesh. <clears throat> Sometimes what will happen is you'll just realize and you'll realize it with uh, peace too, not anger. You'll realize it with peace. You'll say, oh, you know what? I don't, not only do I not need that, but that really wouldn't even be good for me. That'll happen. And what I have found in my own life is that God turns around and gives me something else. And I look at that and I go, wow, now that is great. That's what I really want. How many of you have ever experienced that? Okay, good. Three of us. Okay. But more, but some of you are just chicken about raising your hand. <clears throat> but you, it's true. You go through all that. You come to worship. You get that rebuff and you keep after it. You start clarifying. You start thinking it through and praying and examining. And you're staying. This is all persevering prayer. <clears throat> this is what should be going on as we persevere in prayer. Not just repeating the request. By the way, I want this. It needs to be more than just that. That's a vain repetition. That can be stubborn insistence on your own way. That can be these negative things. That's not what persistency in prayer is about at all. It's about setting your heart after God and going after Him until He stops. That'll usually be when you enter into real worship. I realize she was lost. I know there are some differences here in this story. I get it, but there's still insight for us. Then you get a rebuff, but you keep after it. <clears throat> and then, typically, what beautifully, what I think that happens is suddenly you get that clarity. You, you've gotten some humility. You've gotten some holiness through purification and clarification. You've gotten more clarity on what it is you're asking for and who it is you're asking it from. And, and you're just, you know, I have gone through this exercise so many times. I'm going to tell you something that, that God has taught me. Those ex that exercise always ends up with me on the end of it saying, I got a whole lot more out of this in the process of asking you for it than I ever did in getting the thing I asked for. Did you hear what I just said? I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times I've been through this process and got the thing finally that I was asking for, sometimes with some modifications, and usually modifications that upgraded the request, quite frankly. Becky and I have been through that more than once. He upgrades the request when you finally get, when you finally let go. You say, bottom line is, I just need this, Lord. You know, whatever it might be transportation, a place to live, a type of whatever, a job. I need this, Lord. And you just get to a place you let go, and then all of a sudden you get abundantly above all that you thought. So I'm coming through this process over and over and over again. I get to the other side. I finally, you know, he says, uh, well, I don't know that I've ever gotten such a great compliment as she got. I, I'm not sure the Lord ever came to me and just said, okay, Jerry, you're at a place right now in your life, you can ask for anything and it'll be done. I'm not sure I've ever had that. I don't, I, I'm not going to say. That would be awesome. I hope I'd use it wisely. But I've certainly come often to that place where the grant is given. I get what it is I'm asking for and it's profound. It's amazing. It's yeah, usually he does it in ways that, on, that make sure his fingerprint is on it so he, you have no way of, of rationalizing it away and saying, oh, it just happened by happenstance. No, if you take it, pay attention, God's fingerprint's on it and you know it's him. Now, I gotta get done here. Let's see, I told you it would be short. But anyway, <clears throat> so you get past that rebuff, you get, it, you get the request, and I, I can tell you, in fact, I can't think of a time when rejoicing, giving thanks, worshiping him, praising him for the generosity, the blessing that he, that he did, 
to help me in my time of need, but that I didn't say the most valuable thing that I take away from this exercise was how much closer I have come to be with you. Every time. The most valuable thing. You're going after this. She was go- Look, here's a woman that was going after healing for her daughter. She got that, but she got so much more. I mean, that woman of Canaan, she got, she got, she got theology worked out in her mind. You understand that? She's coming from a pagan, idol-worshiping background into a Jesus Christ as God manifest in the flesh awareness. She got theology worked out. She got all kinds of stuff worked out. She got humbled. She probably, like well, these people of Canaan, probably looked down on the Jews, a lot of anti-Semitism back in those days, you know. And they looked down on the Jews, looked down on this and this, you know, they thought themselves better than them and, you know, whatever. And they have all these attitudes, all these prejudices, all this bias. And for this woman to kneel down in front of a Jewish man and basically call him God, that's huge. And what I'm trying to get across is she got healing for her daughter. That was the main thing. And that's an important thing. That was a beautiful thing. That's a needful thing. But she went home with so much more than that. She went home with a whole new look on life. And your prayer cycle should bring you closer to God and send you forward with greater light than you had going in. That's what perseverance is all about. Okay, you get it? That's what's going on when it's silent. That's what's going on when you're getting a little bit of rebuff. So stay with it. Don't give up. Now, I've adjusted my prayers in the course of the persevering four, five, six times. I've refined my request. I'm not like looking for the angle that'll get him to do it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm looking at this request and I'm examining the light of God's word and as I persevere and keep at it and keep at it, I see things. Oh, okay, let's put that aside. Ah, clean that up. Oh yeah, well, and so on. Amen. Let's stand together, please. We basically got through point one of a three-point outline, but that's okay. We'll just pick it up next time. But I believe there was enough there to chew on. Amen. In that story right by itself, just that little message, I give you a lot to go on. If you will take hold of what you've learned tonight and get excited about going into prayer. Now, don't get excited and say, oh, God, I can't wait until you're silent again. You don't need to worry about it. That's on his part. If it's, time, if, it, if it's time for some silent treatment, he'll know when it's necessary. Oh, I can't wait to get rebuffed in prayer. Well, that's foolishness. If there's a need for that, it'll come up. I'm just saying that when it does, get excited. There's something good coming. You're going to get closer to the Father than you've ever been before. Amen. You're going to get things cleared up. You're going to understand things. That whole business of persevering in prayer. My, what a wonderful opportunity to just get alone and apart with God for a while over something that he uses to help you grow. So church, respond to God. As the Lord has spoken to you, you respond accordingly. Talk to God.